you, Jesus. Wow. Uh, yeah, amen. <laughs> amen. That was beautiful, right? Mm. Yeah. Thank you, Jesus. God Almighty. Thank you for how you're moving, Lord Jesus, in our midst. Thank you. Speak to our hearts and minds through the power of this holy, holy word. We walk into this word, God. It's you. You say that you're one with your word. It identifies you. Your, your, your DNA is on this word, Lord. You're one with it. And we have a conversation with you every time we read it. Every time we, right now, having a prayer with you, we're having a conversation with the living God our Holy Savior, Holy Spirit. Thank you that you stop everything and pay attention to your children. You obviously do. We love you, Jesus. We just ask that you could speak. Speak powerfully through your word, your person. It is who you are. Thank you, Jesus. Just ask you to speak through in the name of Christ. Amen. All right, so I'm going to, yeah, amen. Thank you, Jesus, for what you're doing. Praise you, living God. Praise you, God. All right. I love your energy. You are going to tone that down when I speak, right? All right, all right, perfect, good. Uh, when we get to the end, when we get to the end of the this, of this service, I'm just finishing the message, we're going to sing that again. Please, please, if the Lord moves on your heart, don't hesitate to come up. I'll have people ready to pray with you. If something happens in your heart and you're like not even a believer and someone else brought you here today and you're like, well, you know, I came with a friend. You are here because God wanted you here. That's why you're here. Um, so listen, this is Romans 1. We have finished Acts. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back to a few things that are in it just to make mention of them today, but we're, we're, we made our all 28 chapters and we're now starting Romans. Now, Romans was written way before Acts. Matter of fact, Romans was written probably somewhere between 53, 58 AD. People aren't totally sure, but most everyone, it's almost universally agrees it's while he was in Corinth and establishing that ministry in Corinth, and, and, and he's working with the Corinthians, and that church is booming there all around the tent-making, around the Olympics that were taking place there, and they're making temporary places to live for all the people coming and visiting the, um, the Olympics and, uh, of the time, and Paul's just making uh, a killing in the gospel, not just on tents, being a tent maker, this hooks him up with Priscilla and Aquila who've been kicked out of their home in Rome because uh, I think it was Claudius at the time was kicking everybody out of Rome if they were Christians. And so they're, they're, here they are in Corinth. And he hooks up with them and they start making tents for people and they start spreading the gospel and this church booms there. And God speaks to Paul for the first time we see in Scripture and you find it in Acts, like chapter 19, where he's working with the Corinthians, and God speaks to him and says, I'm going to send you to Rome via Jerusalem, but I'm going to send you to Rome. You must go to Rome. It's going to get rough, but you're going to Rome. I want you to minister to them. So he writes this unbelievable treatise on Christianity. A lot of people call it the Cathedral of Christianity. Romans is just so powerful, so brilliantly written. We, uh, uh, so much of our theology as Christians today is pulled from this book. It is just stunning in that it absolutely exposes our fleshly sin and at the same time tells you you're forgiven and accepted in the kingdom if you just come and confess your sins. It's like this crazy 
algorithm that Christ writes into Romans, and the answer is Jesus loves you and came and died for your sin so you could live with him forever. It starts like this. Romans is in your face. Romans is like reading James. The moment you start reading, it's like, ouch, ooh, ouch, ouch. You know, <laughs> it's like, like yeah, you know, the punches land because it aims for the flesh. But it's to rip out what doesn't belong there because it's not healthy for you. Romans is a surgeon taking out the cancer. So here we go. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God. Okay, so super quick note. By the way, Pharisee does mean set apart. It means you've been set apart by the law. But he uses this to say, I'm now set apart by grace. He was a Pharisee, set apart by law, set apart from everyone else by obeying the law and studying the law better than other people like him. He was, he was in the rat race of Pharisees and he was ahead of his time. And by law, he was a Hebrew of Hebrews and set apart by it. And he was a jerk. And now he says, I'm not set apart by that anymore. I'm set apart for the gospel of God, by God's grace. And he, he goes on, the gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures regarding his son. So again, to quote what was going on in Acts, he tells the people, all the people in Rome when he gets there, let me show you from the Scriptures why Jesus is Lord. And he has no New Testament. He's using only Old Testament, only scrolls, only Isaiah, only the Pentateuch. That's what he's using to show Jews that Jesus has come. He's showing them through their own history. Jesus did the same thing. He said, you guys are putting your hopes in Moses. He's the one that told you that I was coming. And so he, they're using everything in the Word because Jesus is always in the Word of God. You never won't find him there. So he uses again, as he's writing to Rome, he's never been to Rome as far as we know. There's nothing in history that tells us that he was ever in Rome until he gets sent to Rome. Paid for by Rome. The gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets and the Holy Scriptures regarding his son, Jesus Christ, who as to his earthly life was a descendant of David and who through the spirit of holiness was appointed the Son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ our Lord. So by lineage he was through the line of David. He was the Messiah to come. So by birth, by flesh... He is the Messiah, but he's also the Messiah because he's the only one who said, I have authority to lay down my life and authority to pick it back up again. I can die and I can come back to life. My God, my Father gave me that power because I am God the Son. I can lay down my life and pick it up again. That is an authoritative statement and he proved it. Through him we received grace and apostleship to call all the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith for his name's sake. That's going to be one of the three key verses that we look at today. Listen to what's said. Through him, through Jesus, we received grace and apostleship to call all the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith for his name's sake. And you also are among those Gentiles who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. And you also are among those Gentiles who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. The obedience that only comes from faith through his name. Please understand that the word will confront what you think and believe and how you act and how you speak and how you treat relationships and how you treat God. It will change everything 
and it's supposed to. So when the word feels like a gut punch, that is because it's taking something out of your flesh that does not belong there. When the word confronts you and you leave here mad, you're not mad at me. You're mad at God. Take it up with him. You're, when you hear something in the word that, that contradicts how you feel or think, that is because the word itself is designed to do that. He said, I'm bringing a sword, and it will cause division. But it's going to cause division because people are going to view it differently, and you're going to talk about it. And if you fight through that division by fighting for unity, you grow. If you allow that division to just be division, then you weaken. But he's going to cause division. And the, most, the thing he wants to divide you most from is your flesh. The thing that he wants to divide you most from is just what you're going to do based on what you already know and what you already feel like doing. This word's going to challenge that. It will always challenge that. And thank God it does, because then you don't have to stay the hopeless wretch that you are. I speak so, so personally. I don't want to be the sinner that I am. I want to keep being made more like him. I watched a video this week that so blew me away. I was looking for something else and found something I wasn't looking for that God had totally destined me to see. I'm going to share part of it today. And, and a big part of the video was how you treat relationships in the kingdom. And then because I was really, really, I, don't, I shouldn't even talk about it now, <laughs> struggling with missing my kids after being there, uh, I, wasn't in my, I wasn't at my best this week. Uh, I know I wasn't. And because my ramp that grabbed my foot and yanked it up by my ear read the day before that we left um, Florida and like tweaked my leg all out of place because somehow it grabbed my shoe, my, my wheelchair ramp, um, I, I've done something. Uh, my back finally is feeling better, and then I realize I've got a groin pull. This is just amazing, amazing. Then my dog decided to break her leg in two places on Friday. Um, <laughs> Just so you know, veterinarians are not cheap. Uh, it was a fun day in Portland for all day, uh, Friday. And it's just like, it just hasn't been my favorite week. And I was trying to figure out what was wrong, why, why I was in such a bad mood, because stuff happens, life happens. And my amazing brother calls me. Gosh, I, even, I know I shouldn't have said this. <laughs> but he called me while I was in uh, the waiting room for my dog. And... He's like, hey, man, I just want to check on you, make sure you're okay. And I was like, you know, I've just, my, my emotions haven't been right this week. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm kind of angry and I'm frustrated. And, I, and th there's this stuff happening, you know, you don't, I, don't, I, I don't like it when I can't function right. I love to play sports and stuff, and that just irritates me, and that's just flesh again. But stupid stuff's happening. It keeps happening, and then here I am in, you know, Portland, because that was the closest thing we could find to see our dog today. Uh, but I was like, but something else is bothering me. I think it's because I'm just really missing my, and I went to say kids, and the tears started coming down my face, and I couldn't stop it. I'm in a waiting room. It's raining outside, so I quickly rushed out there thinking, you know, <laughs> no, one will, no one will see the difference, you know. Oh, everybody's face is wet out here. Uh, you know, and I couldn't even talk. I couldn't even say anything. I'm trying to say to Dan, this is what's going on, but I can't say it because um, my kids are just sending me the baby pictures. I'm just like, you're killing me. <laughs> because it's just like that distance is hard. I love where I am. I'm so thankful, but I hate not being close to him because we're very, very close. And so I, that was what was bugging me. Wonderfully, the revelation of that pulled the sting out because after I went to my car and cried um, and I had several more hours to do it because they're sedating my dog and taking x-rays and putting her in a cast um, and with a groin pull I'm, I'm carrying her across the parking lot you know <laughs> with her cast out sticking out uh, but with that 
he pulled it out. He extracted it. I couldn't figure out why I was so mad all week. I, you know, I'm, I'm a pretty simple creature. I, 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 something will be wrong, and I can't figure out what it is until God reveals what it is, or my beautiful wife tells me what it is because I can't figure it out. She's like, it's this, and she'll be right. And the Holy Spirit is so amazing at that. And see, what he does is he does it with his word. And he'll zoom in on something that you're struggling with, something that you don't even know why you're so mad or why you're so angry or why you're so hopeless or why you're so not right. And then he zooms in on it and attacks it with his word. And it's just like antibiotics. The more you keep taking them, you start healing. And it's not, it's not as if it happens just that moment. The tears might come and you start to feel a little bit better, but you're still kind of like this, you know? But, you, but the trend starts going like this if you stay in his presence. It starts moving up. Even though it's up, down, up, down, up, down, it's, it's, it's consistently trending up. I'm trending up. Uh, but I was trending down all week <laughs> in a handbasket. But, man, it's just like, it's just like he zeroes in, and he's going to do it with his word. It was, and then I just got in his word. I'm sitting out in my car, I'm listening to worship music, and then I'm looking at stuff, and he's just, he's just feeding me what I need. It's unbelievable how he does it. I don't know how he does it. How would he look in Portland, Maine, little podunk Portland, Maine? There's, there's 9 billion people. Why would he zoom in there? Because I was zooming in to him. It's just that simple. All right, so let me read the rest of this chapter. I haven't even got anywhere yet. Um, 7, verse 7, to all in Rome who are loved by God and called to be his holy people. So he's writing to the people of God who are in Rome. By the way, the church is booming in Rome, and there's no apostle that has started it. What happened was people from Rome, and it tells you this in the second chapter of Acts, are in Jerusalem when Pentecost booms, and they go home, and a church starts. And so the Holy Spirit begins a church in Rome. It's not started by Paul or Peter. It's not started by the other apostles. It's just booming. Priscilla and Aquila come out of that when they're kicked out. This is one of the reasons that they're all kicked out of Rome is because the church is booming and they've had enough of these Christians, so they send them all away. Then they get to go back five years later, and that's the end of this book. We'll talk about that later. But Paul's met a lot of these guys, men and women, who are Christians from Rome, and he mentions them in the last chapter of this book. And you're like, well, if he's never been there, how does he know all these people? Because they came to him because they were kicked out. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith is being reported all over the world. God, whom I serve in my spirit and preaching the gospel of his Son, is my witness how constantly I remember you in my prayers at all times. I pray that now at last, by God's will, the way may be opened for me to come to you. You want to see things happen in this church? Pray for it. If you want to see things happen in this church, if you want to find your place in this church, like I'm, I'm here, I'm kind of sitting here, I'm not really sure what I'm supposed to do, pray for it. Show me what moves you. That's what you want. Show me, Lord Jesus, what moves you. What did you put in me? What do you want me to do? What do you, where do you want me to apply myself? Where do you want me to serve? How can I get more invested? What can I do? You, I, I don't want to just sit here and just come and go and come and go and, and then wonder, well, why am I feeling dry? Because you're not involved enough. You get, you get serving with someone, you'll find your best friends. There are people called to what you're called to. And they'll feel it. And it'll resonate with you. And then God will start booming in this new piece of the ministry. This ministry isn't supposed to be me telling you something you're going home or they're listening to a worship team and going home. It's supposed to be everything that's happening. Everything that it can reach. Everyone that can be affected locally. And we all have spheres of influence that will be at our workplaces and in our families. But there's going to be other things that he starts to do where he puts something on your heart that you didn't even know was there. And it starts to grow out of what you're capable of that other people are not. Pray for the church. Pray for the church family. Pray for God to raise up leaders in this church to be exactly what God called them to be. 
We've got a tremendous set of leaders in this church, wonderful people, people I respect, people I'm humbled by. And we've got a whole bunch more waiting in the wings that don't know it. We just need to apply prayer to this walk. More prayer, hungry prayer, not flippant prayers, not, oh yeah, I forgot to pray. God, I really need to know. Verse 11, I long to see you. This is Paul. He's hearing about him. The Olympics are going on. He's selling tents, and some of the people are from Rome. Like, you should see the church in Rome. There's a lot of stuff happening in Rome. It's really booming. He's like, oh, wow, what's happening? And they're explaining it. It's the same types of things that he's seeing. There's healings. There's, there's miracles. There's, there's people coming in droves to find out who this Christ is, and the church is growing, and, 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 and he, they're telling him the stories. And he's like, wow, I, it, it's being reported all over the world because all these people are coming and meeting here for the Olympics and they're going off to where they're from. And they're telling other people, the church in Rome's got it going on. Mm-hmm. And that's exciting. Sometimes we get stupid and go like, oh, well, what do they got that we don't got? They got the exact same thing, the Holy Spirit. We just got to get hungry for it. All you got to do is be hungry. I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong. That is, that you and I might be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. Not saying, I'm going to come and fix your church. You probably got holes in it. I'll fix them. He's saying, I want to be encouraged by what I see, but I've also got things that you need. We'll help each other. That's what the whole body of Christ is designed to do. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that I planned many times to come to you, but I've been prevented from doing so until now in order that I might have a harvest among you, just as I've I've had among the other Gentiles. I'm obligated both to Greeks and non-Greeks, both to the wise and the foolish. That's why I'm so eager to preach the gospel also to you who are in Rome, because he hasn't been there yet. And here it is. Here's, Here's the meat of this chapter. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Because it's the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. First to the Jew and then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, a righteousness of God is revealed. It's revealed. It means you didn't know it before. It means you didn't have it before. It means there was something wrong inside of you and the word challenged it and now a righteousness was revealed. And now you know, so now you've got an obligation. Do I change what's wrong in me and make an attempt to start doing better at this? Because it's going to be this, trending upward, but you'll come, you'll come down again. But can I start trending upward because I see something in the Word that just revealed something that's broken in me and I didn't know? That's what the Word's designed to do. If you got convicted by, you get convicted by something you hear today or something makes you mad, thank him. It's because he is zooming in on something he wants to deal with in your life to free you, not to cast you down or put you under his thumb or make you feel worthless. It's the last thing God does. That's what Satan does. He is the accuser of the brethren. That's what Satan does. You feel accused? You feel like a loser? You feel like, I don't even have anything to offer this church. That's never God. That's not God speaking to you. I I can just give you that who that voice is coming from. So just in case you were wondering, that wasn't him. That's Satan. Every time an accusation comes in your mind about you not being good enough, you being worthless, you have nothing to offer here, you're just a guest. That's Satan. It is not God. He doesn't speak that way. You'll never find it in his word. He will challenge you. He's a wicked good coach, and he will work you hard. I had a basketball coach that just put eight minutes on the clock and made us run 25-second pro sprints, which make you throw up, by the way, and, and just kept letting it run. He's reading the newspaper. We're like, dude. He was mad because we didn't win by enough points. It's like, you're a loser. The whole time I'm running, I hated that man. Years later, I didn't like that man. They named the gym after him. I'm like, why did they name the gym after him? Because he took the team to the championship seven times. In We were a, 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 a school in Florida. We were 23-2 and two that year, 23-3 and three the next year because they added another school. He knew how to get success. I was talking to another friend. There was a point guard on the team, and he's like, 
He's like, hey, how'd you, how'd you like Coach Wright when we used to play for him? I was like, I couldn't stand that man. I liked him outside of the basketball. He's a nice guy and everything, but I, God, I couldn't stand playing for him. Now, I was playing backup to a guy named Square Lawrence. His square, his, Anthony's his name, but his head was a square, so they called him Square Lawrence. Uh, we had another guy with a real big forehead, and they called him Head Start. He was on the team, too. I didn't think that was appropriate, but I can't remember his name. Uh, yeah, Andre, 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 Head Start. He'd always just be just ahead of you. And, and so, you know, we had this, had this amazing team. This 6'9 guy was ahead of me, played for Alabama, played for Miami, Tremendous basketball player and a good friend. I loved him. But I was the backup center to him. And I didn't play that much. And even when I did play, I played well, but, but he wouldn't let us play. Anyone that wasn't those first five guys didn't play until like the last five minutes of any game. We were up by 50 one game at the half, and he still waited till the last quarter. I was like, I hate your guts. But my, the point guard friend of mine goes, I loved him. He got so much out of me. He taught me how to work. It's like, you were sitting on the bench with me. See, that wasn't at practice. And our second string could beat almost anybody. I'm like, dang it. You're challenging the way I think, and I hate you for it. <laughs> but it really, really made me realize whew, God is a tremendous coach. He knows how to pull the very best out of you, but he's not heartless, and he doesn't bench you. He's working all the time for your benefit. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. Okay, I'll usually do this. I get halfway through the message and ask for the title. So let's go ahead and put that up. The Word of God is both the way you should live and the power to live that way. It's both. It's showing you how you're supposed to live, but it, God is fully aware we're completely incapable of it. We're sinners that are only saved by grace. We're completely incapable of living like Christ did. That's why only one person in the whole history of humankind has been sinless. And he pulled that off for 33 years, and he would have kept pulling it off if he hadn't given his life up for us. We can't make it on our own. We must be challenged. We must be invested in by the Holy Spirit and the Word of God, and it gives you the power to be what you cannot be. It gives you the power to do what you cannot do. It gives you the wisdom to make decisions you're not smart enough to make. It gives you knowledge you didn't have to solve a problem you didn't even know you had. Or one that you do know, but you don't know how to solve. For in the righteous, for in the gospel, the righteousness, verse 17, of God is revealed. We didn't know it, and now we're starting to learn it. A righteousness that is by faith from first to last. Just as it's written, the righteous will live by faith. We must live this way. It is our life. It's our life. My wife and I uh, love this show that's running right now called The Summit. It constantly ticks me off because they vote people off that I really like. Uh, but they're all trying to get to the top of this mountain in New Zealand. So it's breathtaking. It, a lot of the places where they film Lord of the Rings, they're climbing. And so it's really cool to watch. Uh, the Summit. You ought to put, pull it up and watch it sometime. Fascinating show. And they make these poor people just go across giant ravines like a thousand feet down. They just got to hold a, a strap that's like a zip line and, and they're, by their hands they're holding on. But they got a thing if they drop, you know, they're, ca they're caught, but they're out. And so the, everything they make you do is brutal. And the last thing they do is climb a glacier with these two, like, you know, claws, and you've got claws on your feet. And they've already done all this other horrible stuff, so they're exhausted and they're tired, and then they come up to a glacier. Now climb that. You know, everybody's trying to get a million dollars, but the money pool keeps losing. Every time you lose something, their money's in their backpack, they're gone too. <laughs> so it's, quite, it's a fun show to watch. They're halfway up a glacier, 
with two sticks with, you know, the hooks in them, and, and their feet with claws on the front, and they've got to kick in to get on and stay on. They're like a spider going up the side of this glacier. If you drop one, <laughs> you know, it's not going to be a fun trip with just one. Now, people that are really climbing these things, they got little straps, but these guys aren't allowed them because you drop one, you're out, you know? We should treat the Word of God like those two things that stick in the wall. Like you must have them. If you're going to climb towards the king, you must have that Word. You can't afford to drop it. You can't afford to lose it. You can't afford to be missing that line that if you should drop, it catches you. That's the Holy Spirit. You, you, you need all that or you're not going up. You need the Word. You need the Holy Spirit. You need the direction from your Father, but you need the power invested in you to change it, to change what you cannot do. And that comes when you're saved and you receive the Holy Spirit. When you invite Jesus in and say, I, I can't beat this depression. I can't beat this addiction. I can't beat this anger. I can't beat this loneliness. I can't fight. And the Holy Spirit can. Because he has authority to lay down life and pick it back up again. He's got that authority. So a life that feels dead in his hands is vibrantly alive. The righteous will live by faith. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. He's writing this to who? Who's he writing it to? Yes, but I heard it, the church. He's writing, he said, this is to the church at Rome. This is to the believers at Rome. Here's what you need to know, believers. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. That is as much to the body of Christ as it is explaining to them what they're going to deal with with unbelievers. It's as much to them because we'll read the word and we'll try to suppress the truth with what we want it to say. Because you don't want to be confronted in your flesh. So often we'll try to make the word blend with what we feel and what we want it to say so that it's easier, to, it's more palatable. I want the word to say this, but it doesn't. So I'll just pretend it kind of says it. Or I'll just think of it in these terms. Or I'll make this colorful little version of what the word says. Don't do that. Jesus clearly says in Matthew 7, he said, he's doing this unbelievable series of teachings on the mount. And he says, when you take my words and you build your life on them, and you, like, like those hooks that you're putting in the glacier, when you build your life like that and you won't go anywhere without my word and you won't make a decision apart from my word or that violates it, at least to your best knowledge, when you're fighting to do things by my word, it's like building a house on a rock. And then, and then a, a storm will come and the wind and the rain will come and they'll beat against that house and they can't destroy it or even harm it because it's built on the rock and the foundation solid. But when you build your house on things that are not my word and things that you just want it to be my word, he's talking to the believers. When you build something that's not based on my word, who's listening to his word? The believers. When you people he's talking to all these people, when you build something that's not based on my word, you're building it on sand. And when you build on sand, the storm will come again. And the wind will come. It's coming either way. The storm's coming. The storm's coming. You can't avoid the storm. Every, with everything perfect in your life, the storm's coming. Everything 
You did everything right in your marriage. Storm's coming. You did everything right as a parent. Storm's coming. You did everything right at church. A storm is coming. Matter of fact, the more righteous you are, the more chance a storm's coming. Trust me. I don't say trust me because I'm righteous. Trust me because I've seen both. Storm came either way. You want to be able to withstand the storm? Be on the rock. He said, you, if you're on the sand, it's just going to... So think about it. Think about what he's saying. He's saying, when the wind and the rain keep hitting something, they erode it away. So you're on the rock. That's perfect. But when you're on the sand, you know what you're on? Wind, rain, wind, rain, wind, rain. You're, you're, you're on all these eroded pieces of the word that's mixed with all these other things of the world. Sand isn't made of just one rock. Sand's made of all kinds of stuff and all kinds of local stuff that's broken apart and weathered and beat up and mixed with the rock, the little pieces of rock that you're holding on to. Build your life on little pieces of God's word, but not the whole bedrock, and mix it with the world, and you are in danger. You're on sand. I got, I'm going to use some of what God says, but I don't like this section here. I don't like this part that says later in Romans 1. I don't like that. So I'm not going to really just, I'm just going to take the parts I like. When you do that and treat God's word like a buffet table, you're on sand. You're mixing it with other stuff. It's dangerous. And, and Jesus is clear about it. If you want to take a few eroded pieces of rock and mix it with all kinds of world, you're on a bad foundation. Twenty. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power, his divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood from what's been made. So people are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise... They became fools and they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like a mortal human being and birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore, God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and they worshipped and served created things rather than the Creator, who's forever praised. Amen. And because of that, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Even their women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men, and they received in themselves the due penalty for that error. Furthermore, just as they didn't think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so God gave them over to a depraved mind so that they do what ought not to be done. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They're full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They're gossips slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They've got no understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy. Whew. Dang. Now you read it at home, just quietly reading it to yourself. It doesn't quite have the same ring, does it? Then had just listening to the list? That's the flesh. That's the flesh apart from God's word. That's sand. 
A little bit of God, a little bit of the world until you keep crashing. Although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, we innately know they not only continue to do those very things, but they approve of those who practice them. It's a rough list. So part of the video that blew me away, it was our video. We were looking for something else. We found this, and all three of us just sat there like, oh, so cool. He was doing the prodigal son. I hadn't seen it from this angle. But you know the prodigal son. The father is supposed to be like God. He's got two boys. One of them's like, Dad, you're dead to me. I want your inheritance now. So dad gives it to him. The other son stays home, keeps working the farm. Dad's rich. Boy gets a lot. He goes and squanders it with prostitutes, the word says, partying. He's just off doing his thing, having a blast. Then it runs out. And he finds himself in a pig pen. It's the only place he can get work. Pigs, at that time, were unholy to God's people. So God is making a very serious point. This is a Gentile. These are my two children. This would be like, after the flood, you've got Noah and his boys. Everyone believes. How did we get to now? In Genesis 5, it says they only thought evil all the time, and God had to judge it. So he floods the whole earth, saves Noah and his boys and their wives. Eight people on the ark. Everyone comes off that ark is a believer in God. And here we are. The, not just majority, the entire population on earth were believers. How do we get here? How do we get to that list we just read? So this dad... He's got these two boys, and one goes off, and he finally comes to his senses and goes, I am in the pig pen. I'm in the mud. I have mixed the world with my father's teaching, and it got me here. I'm going back to dad. If I can just be brought into this as a servant, like his servants, that's all I want. I don't need to be a son again. If I could just get into the household, it would change everything. I'm going home to dad. I'm going back. And he goes home, and the fa- he doesn't even get close. The father sees him, races off. He's been watching for him. He's so excited. Put the best robe on my son. Put a signet ring on his finger so he can do business in the kingdom again. He's got my authority. Put, put shoes on his feet. And, and, he, and he rushes to him. And he brings him home, and they, and they kill the fattened calf. There's a sacrifice for his sin. Do you hear it? There's a sacrifice. There is a sin offering. And relationship is restored. And that older brother hates it. I've been there the whole time. You didn't sacrifice nothing for me. I've been serving you forever. I'm not even coming into the party. I'm not coming in. And the father's pleading with him, come in, your brother, he's back. We have to praise God. That's amazing. He's here. He's, he's, he's better. No, no, I want nothing to do with him. You know he squandered that money with prostitutes. You know the life he lived. You found him with the pigs. No. I had not seen it. I can't even believe it. I'm mad at myself for this. But after going all the way through Acts and seeing how all of the Hebrews who were finding Christ, they were believers, but they were very, very steeped in the law and tradition. They're believers, and they see that the Gentiles are running to Jesus for the first time ever. These bunch of losers from the pig pen, squandering everything with just sexual immorality in the Roman way, they're running to Christ. We don't want them in our church. It's the last place we want to see them. Can't we just keep our little comfortable group and our culture and our thing? They're messing stuff up. 
They walk in there. They don't eat the meat. We, they, I mean, they're eating all kinds of meat we're not supposed to eat. They don't follow any of the rules. They don't know how to act. Get them out. Give them their own, like, Gentile church. They want nothing to do with them. Matter of fact, Paul gets all kinds. Paul's on his way to Rome because the Christian Jews want to kill him for bringing a Gentile into the temple. The Christian Jews meet with him and say, we got a problem, Paul. Everybody says that you don't really do things the Jewish way anymore, which was not true. These two sons are those two people. You've got the, you've got the, you've got the Jews looking at all the Gentiles coming in going, they're the pig herders. They're, they're, they're the ones. They're the slimy Sexually immoral, messed up ones. They don't belong here. We've been serving you all this time. And you're going to let them in? That's who it is. Jesus is telling the parable. He knows what's about to happen. He's going to save the Gentiles. He's prophesying all the way back a thousand years about this, God has. I'm going to bring my people back. I'm going to call them from the dark places that they're in. Who do you think was whispering to him in the to him in the pig pen? The Holy Spirit, go back to dad. Go back to dad. And then they come and they don't want him in the church. That is a massive problem. So you got these two crazy pieces battling each other. The amazing grace of a living God and our sin and resistance to obeying the word even as believers. Here's how you're supposed to live. No, that's stupid. That's stupid. Love is love. A man can love a man. Love is love. That's a lie. That's from Satan. It is not love. It's not. It's broken. It's dangerous. And it's sand. And it will break. It's not love. He's love. Does he say that because he hates homosexuals? No, let's not be stupid. Grace to call from the pig pen. Otherwise, I got no business in the kingdom. I got my own set of sins that would have precluded me from ever entering the gates of heaven. I would go to hell in a handbasket. Just this week alone, I have not been awesome. And I know the word, but it was the word that called me out of the pig pen yet again. Amen. If you so human, if you because it's today's word. And one of the things, one of the points you made in the video that's so, I've heard it once before, but it didn't stay with me. He said, do we want Hollywood or holy word? Which do we want? I was like, ooh. See, because Hollywood tells you, if you're going to pursue a relationship, you ought to have sex with that person first and make sure that you are compatible in every way before you get married, because that way, once you're married, you know that you're set. That's not from the Word of God. The Word of God would call that fornication. The Word of God calls that sexual immorality. It is not something that is looked upon in the Word as, oh, this is okay. No, it's okay. I'll just turn a blind eye. When you're married, it'll be all better. I didn't even succeed in that. I blew that. Be honest. Wish to God I'd done that better. I didn't. God's grace. But the reality is, 
once he speaks and you know, now you know. Once it's revealed and you know, you have an obligation. Do I want to live this way and keep living this way, even though it's kind of in the kingdom, but kind of on sand? It's partly the word of God. I really love him, but I also don't agree with this part of the word, so I think that's not right. Or it just doesn't line up with what I want to do, and I'll deal with that when I get to that. I'll cross that bridge when I come to it. When you come to the bridge is when Christ says you're at the bridge. When he reveals it to your heart and he's revealed it to you, that's when you're at the bridge. That's when you're there. That's when you get to the bridge. You want to cross that bridge? Put God's word down over it and walk across that. I've gone a little long. But we need to do this song. Can we do this song? If you've got to go, go ahead and sin. No, I'm just kidding with you. <laughs> just joking. That was, wow, just, just kidding. What a, wow, it's just easy, easy, easy. I was so kidding. So there's grace for that. There's grace if you leave now. There's grace. I'm, I'm way kidding. But what I will say, what I'm not kidding about is,